just a moment, I want to pray over our campus here in Alamo and in Dublin. But before I do, I just felt the Holy Spirit impress upon me just to encourage moms of young children and elementary age children. But even as I, I felt like the Lord even said, this is to all moms. I feel like the Lord wants you to know and encourage you that you are enough. That God is leading you. He's protecting you. And as I drove here this morning, I envisioned that you are a tree. And on that tree is fruit. And that fruit is representative of your children. And God is protecting the fruit. It is attached to the branch. Don't worry. That's his responsibility. Our job is to be grounded, be planted, be planted in his word, be planted in his house where you can receive and be nurtured and he will take care of the fruit. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Let's pray this morning. Father God, I thank you. I thank you, Father, for your presence and your power in this place this morning. Lord, we humbly come before you. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us and open up our heart in a new and fresh way today. Lord, I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to invade our heart, invade our place, our home, our neighborhood, our office, our encounters with people as we lean into the power of the Holy Spirit Feed us today. We receive it, what it is that you have for us today, God. And we give you all the praise and all the glory for your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen church. Amen. 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 Awesome. Awesome. You may be seated. And um, I want to uh, just take a moment and say uh, thank you for giving to Convoy of Hope and to Anthem Church. Um, I'll give you some numbers hopefully by next week. But uh, today, right now, in fact, uh, Anthem Church in Oakland is having their very first Sunday. So would you join me and just let's pray over them and ask God to show up in a really remarkable way. So give me just a minute where we just pray, Jesus, um, show up in Oakland in a unique way, in a, in a brand new place, not only as your name is lifted up, you said you would draw people to you. I pray there would be an unusual draw to that school today. I pray that somehow people driving by would take interest. I pray, pray that people who have heard stories of a church being started would show up. I pray that people that have invited people who might have said no all of a sudden decide that they're going to say yes and they're going to be there today. And, and regardless of all the great things that will happen today, Lord, this is the beginning of something that's going to be um, producing fruit for years to come. So bless each person that's given, bless each person that's there serving, bless the pastor and the leaders, and do in and through them what you have for Oakland. We pray that this would not be the beginning of a church, but the beginning of a movement there in a great way. Thank you for that in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. And uh, you know, uh, we don't always get to be on the front line. Sometimes we are the resourcing line. And uh, that's what this church is, and that's what we do. And uh, I'm looking forward to some great stories. And, and a dear friend of mine is actually the dad of uh, Tyler, and Tyler and Nicole are the pastors. And uh, he's in town, and he's texting ahead of time, uh, expressing uh, his gratitude to this church. And you wouldn't quite understand some, I know all of us have different experiences, but when, when you're a dad of a kid who's stepping out to church plant and you know others have come along because you know you feel responsible as a dad, what can you do? But then others come along. And that helps and encourages dads. And uh, so there's even a dad over in Oakland that just today uh, wanted me to say thank you to you. And uh, anyway, we'll tell you some great stories about that uh, shortly. So today I want to talk about God leading you. God leading you. This is one of the great promises of the Bible. God wants to forgive you. God wants to heal you. Uh, God wants to, as you heard Pastor Ben talk about last week, lead you out of temptation. But God wants to lead you in your decisions. How many will admit on your own you can mess some things up? You want to admit that? Like we need God's leadership. We need his guidance in our lives that, in other words, your best life is not your best effort. 
Can I say that again? Your best life is not your best effort. Your best life is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Uh, it's on your notes. We'll have it up on the screen. Would you read this out loud with me? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not under your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. God will direct your paths. God will lead you. God has plans for you. But did you notice in Proverbs 3 that verse 5 precedes verse 6? I like to get the deep things out early. Did you notice this? Okay, so verse five, the reason I'm highlighting this is in week two we talked about promises of God. Some of them are conditional. In other words, some of them have a part you do and a part God does. You can't do what God's gonna do, but he's not gonna do what you're supposed to do. And verse five is about us. Our part, in fact, it's a two-parter. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. So not just part of your heart, not just your Sunday heart, not just your religious part of you, all of your heart. And then here's the second parter. Do not lean on your own understanding. How many, again, one more time, how many will admit you have opinions? Okay, Ben talked about this last week too. Like, we got opinions. Uh, I heard somebody one day say, uh, if you want to make God laugh, share your ideas with God. Like, give him your opinion. Give him your five-year plan. Um, I, I don't know if God has laughed or if he's rolled up his eyes or, or, or if he's just cried at some of my plans. But I've given my plans to God. And, and then I've learned this. God's ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. In other words, I should go through life not trying to get God to do my will. I should go through life surrendered to his will, believing that he wants to lead me. This is the better way to live. And so congratulations because you're here today. This is part of how God leads us. I actually believe that a Sunday service, certainly in my life I can tell you this, God has used the Sunday gathering to lead my life. I've sat through services just like this, and a song God used, a prayer at the end of a service God used, uh, God used a word somewhere, God used a message somewhere, and I said, that was for me today. I needed that today. That gave me guidance. That gave me direction. That gave me encouragement. If you're in a life group, that's even better because you actually have to, you can have like dialogue with other people. How many times do we have something where honestly, the, the prayer could happen right there? You know what, tomorrow I got this big decision. You know, um, last week this thing happened and, and then you have people right there to pray with you and sometimes even give you some encouragement. Sometimes give you some wise advice that there is, that's in their heart. And so that's all of the ways God uses, like he uses his, his word, he uses circumstances, he uses church services, he uses the people of God. But today, I wanna specifically talk about God wants to give you a word. A word. Like this is God's written word. So God thought there were some things that were so important that he wanted to write them down. So whether you live 2,000 years ago or whether you live in 2019, there would be some things in writing from God. God used other people to write it, but God preserved it. God led them. This is God's word. God wanted us to have some things written down so our faith is not a subjective faith. Our faith is personal, but we don't make it up personally. Like we go to his word. But there are some things that we need from God where he impresses his thought on our thoughts. His spirit onto our spirit because not everything you will face is written in the Bible. In other words, blonde or brunette. It's not in the Bible. Or redhead. Or purple or green or orange. I mean, you can get all kinds of hair color. Like I, I in my 20s, married a brunette. Now I'm married to a blonde. Okay, same person, just different hair product. And so... Um, it, but it wasn't in the Bible. And, and so one of the biggest decisions in your life will be, will I get married, and if so, who? To whom? And uh, too many people are relying on their own understanding. It's called living together. Okay, let me help some of you out today. All right, you can do that, but that's just you relying on your own understanding. That's you saying, I'm not really sure. Let's try this and see. But you know what? God already knows. God already knows something and he can lead you to the person that you can make a commitment to because rather than building your relationship on, let's see if it works, what if you built your relationship on God has led us together? That's a whole different way to live out your relationship that you believe God brought you together. Not just for today, but for 10 years from now, 20 years from now, like it's God's will. That's the better way. Lean not on your own understanding. What about which college to go to? You can look through the Bible. You're not even going to find Hebrew University in the Bible, all right? 
It's not in there. What about your career path? God will tell you how to behave on your job, but he won't tell you which job in the Bible to take. So you gotta get a word. You gotta get a prompting from God that one feels right and the other feels that, that, that that's not it. And so I wanna take you to a story in the Bible that I think illustrates this. I've never taught on this uh, passage before until about 30 days ago, I shared it with our staff, and I thought, you know what, this is the kind of message that our entire church needs to hear to. It comes out of 1 Samuel 23. It involves a guy named David, Um, If you don't know who David is, so he's a shepherd um, who God then appoints and anoints to be the next king of Israel. The problem is there's going to be some time between the appointment and the actual taking over, and sometimes that involves waiting. Most of us hate waiting. uh, But during the waiting, you know what can happen during waiting? Preparation. God, God getting you ready. And this is going on in David's life. And uh, while he's waiting and while he's getting ready, he's also on the run from the current king, King Saul. Saul is jealous. Saul has uh, emotional issues. Saul has all kind of issues. And uh, it makes him actually put a, a contract out on David's head. You think you have a hostile environment to live in, to work in? David would beg to differ. David would say, you, you, have, you have a coworker talking behind your back? I got an army trying to hunt me down. This is David's story. And yet, David is a leader. David has trusted God with all of his heart. And, and during this stage, God is bringing some people around David, and David is learning how to lead these men. One day, he hears about a town named Keilah. Say Keilah. So Keilah is this Jewish town that um, is now being raided by a Philistine, you know, um, raiding party. The Philistines to Israel were like the Klingons were to Captain Kirk. Or the Dodgers are to the Giants. Okay, whatever, whatever rival you have in your you know, mind, use that as your metaphor. It just happens to be that the, you know, the Philistines are a constant rival to Israel, to David, now to this town, Keilah, and they're ripping off the grain out of this town, and David hears about it. He's not yet the king, but he's developing the heart of a king. Saul should have been protecting this town. But he's not, he's got his mind on other things. And so David begins to wonder if he should do something and that's where we pick up this story. Samuel 23 verse one. It says when David was told, look the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and they're looting the threshing floors, they're stealing all the grain. David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up and attack these Philistines? And the Lord answered him, and by the way, when it says this in the Bible, uh, don't, don't think audible voice. Now, it could have been, but oftentimes, especially even today, like I've never heard the audible voice of God. The Bible would even refer to the still small voice, to to an inner prompting. It just says that God spoke and David heard. So think about it more on the inside. Like the most, the deepest part of you is not your physical senses. The deepest part of you is your spirit. So God's prompting him. God's putting thoughts in his mind. He hears God. Go attack the Philistines and save Keilah. Go and save. By the way, this is really interesting because this is something God has been saying down through history and certainly Jesus turned it into what's called the Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples. In other words, go and save. Do you know God has been saying that to his people throughout history? Go and save people. Go and help people. Go and bless people. Go and do something that makes a positive difference in the world. Well, that's part of this story. But David's men said to him, here, even here in Judah, we are afraid. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the Philistines? In other words, they're saying, David, Come on, we're out here hiding from Saul's army right now. Like if we come out of our caves and out of the hills and we go down into the flat plains, into that town, I mean, it's gonna be like a bat signal in the air to Saul. He's gonna know exactly where we are and he's gonna come after us. Well, now is it time to lean on your own understanding? You know, maybe God's voice wasn't the best voice. No, now is the time to trust the Lord with all your heart Lean not on your own understanding. So this is what David does. He, he goes back to God. I love this. It's almost like he's saying, God, my boys have brought up a good point. 
Like, I'd like to make sure I got the right prompting. I want to make sure I get this right. And so it says, once again, say once again. Once again, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said, and the Lord answered him, go down to Keilah, and I'm going to give you the Philistines into your hand. Like this time, the prompting comes with a promise. Like, go, and I'm going to be with you. And yet, if you read this correctly, his guys weren't really worried about the Philistines. His guys were worried about Saul. But I've learned this. God will often not prompt you with the second word until you act on the first word. And the first word was go and save these people. And yet they're concerned about Saul, but they go anyway. David prays again. He commits, convinces his guys this is God. And in verse 6 it says this, So David and his men went to Keilah. They fought the Philistines and they carried off their livestock. Like, like it's saying, you steal their grain, we'll steal your cows. We'll give you their cows, you know, because that's what we're going to do here. And so you inflicted heavy losses on the Philistines and saved the people of Keilah. And if the story ended there, this would be like Robin Hood, except it's David and his merry men. And they've just ripped off the other people and they've given the stuff back to the people. But the story doesn't stop there. So if this was a mu- movie, like cue the ominous music the background music, you know, because all of a sudden it's coming on because what's going to happen next is exactly what his guys warned David of. Verse 7, Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah and he said, God has delivered into my hands David, for David has imprisoned himself and entered a town with gates and bars. Okay, not that kind of bar. All right, this is not David chugging a few with Saul. You know, like, hey, let's just get David drunk. It'll be easier to capture him. No, wrong kind of bar. All right, What's, what Saul is thinking is, is this is a, a walled city in the middle of a valley, and all we have to do is surround it, and it's like he will be in jail until the people give him up. Exactly what his guys worried about. So Saul called up all, say all. So Saul's not fooling around. It's one thing to take on a few, you know, raiding parties from the Philistines, but this is the entire army of Israel. So Saul called up all of his forces for battle to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. So now is it time to rely on your own understanding? Like, God, this, this, this following you has actually put us in some danger. But David realizes God still understands, like the story's not all over yet. Just because this, you know, has some challenges doesn't mean that God's not in this. And so um, he's acknowledging God in all of his ways. And verse 9 says this. When David learned that Saul was plotting against him, he, he said to Abathar, the priest, bring in the ephod. Now, the ephod some religious article that the priest had, and, and, and it, it, there's no point really to get into that as much as this. The priest was brought into the story. The man of God was brought into the story. Like, um, it was great that his, his guys had some ideas for him, but right now, he needs the man of God. He, he, like, now the stakes are even higher, and David doesn't want to get this wrong. He's not just going to go to the Lord by himself. He's got the priest. It's like, when two or three gather in my name, there I am in the midst. Like, he doesn't want to get this wrong. Like, God, this is complicated. And um, I need to surround myself with the right people. Again, this is why life groups are so valuable. Because at the time in which you need this kind of help, you can't just manufacture these kind of relationships. David had a relationship with Abathar before this ever happened. This is why being a part of a church and being grounded in a church is so important because there's prayer team members. There, there's people that can help you. And so this is David's story. He's now adding more weight to the story by bringing in the man of God. And now he prays again. But he's, 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 he's with somebody. And David said, Lord God of Israel... Your servant has heard definitely that Saul plans to come to Keilah. Like, it's all over social media, God. I mean, Saul's tweeting this thing out. Like, check me out and my army, we're going to Keilah to destroy the town on account of me. And so David inquires of the Lord again. Will the citizens of Keilah surrender me to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Lord God of Israel, tell your servant, prompt me, like put a thought in my mind, and the Lord said, he will. He's coming, you heard correctly. And he said, well, will will the people of Keilah give me up? God said, they will. With a fork in your back and an apple in your mouth, I mean these people will give you up. I mean the people you just saved, David? Yeah, they'll give you up. This has got to be like the the shortest lived hero status in all of history. Like one day it's, yay David, and it's like, who's David? 
David who? Give him to Saul. We don't need him in our town. And God puts on his heart that they're going to give him up. So I love this next thing. So David and his men, about 600 in number, left Keilah and kept moving from place to place. And when Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he did not go there. Like the thing never happened. Now, how is that for divine guidance? Like, would you not want this kind of guidance in your life? Like that bad thing could have happened, but then God prompted you and you did something different and all of a sudden the thing that could have happened didn't happen. But you gotta know the difference of when to go up and save people and when to back down because it's not your job and this is what David's doing and how often do we get this wrong? How often are we fighting battles God never put us in and we're not saving people that God wants us to save? How many times are we kind of messed up all emotionally and then we have no energy in which to go reach out and give somebody a blessing, give somebody help, give somebody resources because we're all kind of all knotted up over here because we didn't hear from God, we're relying on our own understanding. There's a time to step up and save people and there's there's a time to step down and get out of this thing. Relying on your own understanding or letting God direct you in all of your ways. I want to talk about how to tune up, turn, turn up your spiritual hearing. This is so valuable, and I understand this. Anything in the Bible can be believed, but over time, it gets deeper. Anything you have in your life has a starting point, and the longer you stay in it, the more you can learn. So I understand on this topic, some of you are at the beginning of stages of it. Some of you are learning you know, how to hear from God. Some of you have been listening to God, but today is, again, maybe there's going to be a few th- thoughts that will come to your mind that help even tune your ear even more. I want you to start um, with number one, and that's this. Believe, say believe. Believe, believe you can hear from God. It is normal for the believer rather than being reserved by God for special people or special times. You could read this story and say, well, God God had picked David. God's speaking to David because David was special. No, God spoke to David because David inquired of the Lord. There's no inference that his guys required of the Lord. They were relying on earthly wisdom. Now, they weren't wrong. It was going to cause problems. It was going to alert Saul. They were actually right, but it wasn't God's path. It wasn't God's word to David. The word wasn't stay in the cave. The word was go. Take care of this. Be, be, the, be the help to this town that Saul should have been in the first place. Let me apply this to some of you today. Some of you, for a lot of reasons, have an X in your life. Okay, an ex-wife, an ex-husband, an ex-boss, an ex-roommate, an ex-something. And, um, and there's constant tension, there's, there's, there's battles. If you don't get this right, you will be fighting battles you should not be fighting. You'll be having arguments, you'll be going through a whole bunch of things, and you will not be giving your energy to your kids or to your friends or to your church in the way that you're supposed to because you get this backwards. This is how important this is. There are times where God wants to give us a word, but here's what some of us need to do with our prayers. Too many of us tell God our best ideas and say, God, bless my idea. Many of us need to learn to do what David did. He inquired of the Lord. How many of our prayers don't include inquiring? God, help me know what to do. God, show me your path. God, I'm in the middle of this thing and I don't know which path to take. God, I need to know what path is yours. That's an inquiry prayer. Circumstances will drive you to reaction. God's voice will lead you to the right action. Let me say this again. Circumstances will drive you to reaction. God's voice will lead you to the right action. Can you say amen to that? Now add number two to that. You can't just believe. Number two is give time. Say time. Time. Give time to hear from God. Anybody notice that life is busy? You know, those of you that are parents especially, you know, trying to get your kids back to school, I'm telling you, um, I I remember these stages of our lives like, um, this is harder for me getting my kids to school than I think it is for the kids, and then I have homework. Why do I have so much homework as a parent? I thought I was done with homework. And so life gets complicated. Many of you have busy jobs. Many of you have lots of things. And it is very easy to let normal life crowd out God's voice. I've discovered this. The important things seem not to make time for themselves. The busy things make time for themselves. The important things, you have to make time for them. You did that today. You got up, you came to church. That's making time for an important thing. 
Getting away from all the noise is an important thing. I ran across this cartoon. I think it illustrates where maybe some of us are. Take a quick look. You'll get a, a little sense of what I'm talking about. Here's so many of us who are so discouraged. God, I can't hear you. You know, and then we got, we got everything in our ears. You know, everybody's got our attention but God. Sometimes you have to turn everything off, turn off all your electronics, turn off all the noise, and find a quiet time with God. And don't just do it when you need the help. Do it as a habit. Start your day this way. Have a few moments of quiet time before God to say, God, today direct my path. God, today I'm gonna have a bunch of decisions. I, I believe this. In any work environment, somewhere, you can find a quiet moment in your cubicle, you can find a quiet moment down a hall around a corner in the basement. You can like go around to the back of the, the building for, for a moment. If you, need, if you need three minutes, I bet you could find three minutes even in the middle of the busiest day. I have sat at my desk at different times and I've just said, God, I need a word. And I close my door and I slow things down because life will keep you from hearing God's voice. Now add number three to this, or add a practical point to this. Um, most of us love God to say yes. Can we admit this? Don't you love to pray and God says yes to your prayer? Let me, yes, yes, that's the answer right there. <laughs> yes to yes. But I wanna tell you something, some of the most significant guidance I have received from the Lord involved a in no, or a not yet, or a not that way. Back in my college days, I'm seeking God, which um, meant mostly I'm checking out the girls. Okay, hashtag let's get real, all right? <laughs> and uh, when I'm trying to get a yes, God's given me a no. Not, no, not her, no, not her, not her, not her, well, let's be honest, there wasn't that many, okay, all right. <laughs> I'll stay on the honest side of this story. Um, but how valuable it was for me to hear a prompting from God to, the no, to have a no in the wrong relationship so I could be ready for the right relationship. Yeah. So many people are still hanging on to the wrong one, hoping to get the right one, but you gotta let go with no so you're ready for the yes, and that's where we're leaning on our own understanding instead of trusting God in all of our ways. I'd let go of no so that one day I'd meet Crystal and I could say yes. Now, it would take her longer to say yes back, all right? Some of us, some, one of us was slower than the other. Oh, no, that's not what it was, all right? But that did happen. Like, you know, I was more ready to say yes than she was, but now, for the last 35 years, we've been saying yes to each other. Mostly, I've been just saying yes to her, okay? So good, good, good husband lesson here for many of you. Happy wife, happy life. Let's just, it's in the Bible somewhere, I think, okay? And then uh, later on in my career, one of the most important career decisions I ever made had to do with a no prompting to something I'd been praying that God would say yes to. And all of a sudden the opportunity was there and I could not get over feeling like God was saying no to what I wanted to say yes to. When I finally said no, three months later, I get a call from California. We are here in California today because I said no to a big opportunity that I thought had my name on it, but God had other plans. I had no idea I was gonna get that call. I had no idea that opportunity was there, but God did. And so my no set me up to be able to say yes, and we're here today because I turned down a big thing that I've been praying that God would say yes to, but I'm telling you today, there's times where God needs to say no to you and you need to say yes to his no. Write that down, all right? Sometimes I need to say yes to God's no. Like, I need to agree with God that that is a no. There's been other times where it's been a not yet. Not yet. How many times are we impatient? How many times do we get ahead of God? How many times do we just not slow things down until it's the right time? And then there's the no, not that way. Not that way. Some of you that are wanting to be good parents, you're, you're doing this. You're wanting to be a good parent, but you're putting your kids first instead of God first. That's actually doing the right thing the wrong way. God never said put your kids first. God said put him first. You put God first and he will help you with everything else. It's not family first, it's God first. And so it looks right, it sounds right, but it's the right thing the wrong way. God is saying to some of you, wrong way, right thing, wrong way. 
Put me first. There was a time where Peter was in the garden with Jesus on the night of the crucifixion, and Peter is there to serve Jesus, and yet this army of soldiers comes. Jesus is gonna get arrested, and Peter thinks he's supposed to help out, so he pulls out this sword, and with the accuracy of a two-year-old, slices off a guy's ear. You know he wasn't going for the ear. You know he's going for the throat, but he just had bad, bad you know, um, sword coordination, and so he, he, he's like, and Jesus says, put that thing away. Right attitude to serve me, wrong method. And too often times we're trying to get good outcomes using the wrong method. I'm so grateful over the years I've tuned my ear to some of this. Where I had the letter all written and God prompted me to tear it up. Had the email all ready to send and God said delete it. Had the speech all made and God said don't give it. Crystal and I have been married 35 years. We're happily married today, largely because I didn't give some of the speeches. (laughs) I'm a public speaker. I have speeches. I have things to say. And and I'm telling you, we could have both done this, but I'm just giving you my side of the story. Like right now, I I can tell you there are things I was ready to say, and they were good. Whoa, it was good. And then God said, shut your mouth. (laughs) Some of you don't think God talks that way. Well, maybe he doesn't to you, but he does to me. Like, no isn't enough. Like, right now, it's like, dude, I think God says dude. Like, (laughs) dude, shut your mouth unless you want to be on the couch. (laughs) Shut your mouth unless you want to be in the doghouse. Shut your mouth unless you want to be in the attorney's office. Like, I mean, you know, it's like, just sometimes don't do what you think you want to do because you're relying on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. And sometimes that has to do with what you don't do so that you can be ready to do what God wants you to do, which involves, number three, stay humble. Say humble. Humble. Even though hearing God's prompting doesn't involve an opinion poll, because even good people can get this wrong. David was surrounded by a bunch of men who had a good idea. Like, their idea wasn't a bad idea. Their idea actually had merit. It just wasn't as high as God's thoughts. So they had thoughts, they weren't wrong thoughts, they just weren't as high as God's thoughts. And so humility isn't taking an opinion poll, but humility is willing to go back and ask God a second time. That's what David did. Like, God, are you sure? Did I hear you correct? Humility invites somebody else that maybe is more spiritually mature than you are into the conversation because it's normal to seek confirmation or clarity. It's normal. Sometimes through more time in prayer, And often through the wise counsel of the right spiritual leaders, David inquires of the Lord a second time. That's humility. David brings um, the right voice into the story. That's humility. And humility positions you for clarity. And humility positions you for confirmation. And when you make the right decision, you'll have peace. Oftentimes, when it comes to this stage, I'm actually looking for peace. It's the word but it's also the sense of peace. That's the one, that's the choice. I need to step out, I need to back down. I need to say this, I don't need to say that. And I'm so grateful over the years when I look back on when I did this the right way and God gave me peace and I say thank you God that I said that. Thank you God I didn't say that. Thank you God I went there. Thank you God I didn't go there. God wants to give you peace in the middle of this difficult situation. And then, do you know what happened in this story? More people were saved. When the people of God get this right, more people get saved. David and his men saved the people of Keilah. They fought the battle they should fight. They went after people to save them. And then he didn't fight another battle, and he not only saved himself when he didn't fight Saul, because that battle was never supposed to happen, He saved himself. If you didn't notice, he had 600 guys with him. He saved 600 guys. He saved Saul, who was God's man at the time. Even though Saul's not behaving right, it's God's guy, and God had an army behind that guy, and that battle never happened, so no bloodshed took place, and so those people got saved, and because they did it God's will, God's way, people got saved. Parents, I want to tell you something. Some of your kids are waiting for you to go all in with God. They, they know the difference between when you're partly in and when you're all in. 
And I'm not saying all in means you know everything about the Bible. I've discovered this. You can go all in with your heart with not, without knowing everything about the Bible. You can go all in in your commitment to something even though you know you're gonna learn many, many things down the road. And if you just hold back and say, well, it's kind of God and it's kind of me, that's you relying on your own understanding. Some of your kids are depending on you to get to the place where you say, God, we're all in as a family. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a declaration some of you need to make. Your kids' salvation is weighing in the balance. Some of you who are teenagers, some of you who are millennials, let me, let me encourage you with something. You might have not grown up in the environment that we're talking about, but you know what? You might have an influence on your friends and your family and your parents. We have stories in our church where one day a teenager wound up in our youth program and a teenager decided to go all in. And a teenager's attitude got changed. Can I tell you something? When a parent sees an attitude change in a teenager, that's God. All right, that's a miracle. Even, even skeptical parents are starting to go, oh, what? like what's that? Well, God, well maybe I need that. And then they come and they give their life to Christ. We've seen parents commit their lives to Christ because teenagers went all in. We've seen millennials who are far from God commit their lives to Christ because some other millennials said, you know what, I don't know everything about God, but I'm going all in. Because at the end of the day, what really matters is that people get saved. People get to Jesus. There is an East Bay, there is a Bay Area of people waiting for churches like ours to decide we are gonna fight the right fight. We are gonna go after people. We're gonna give our resources. We're gonna give our time. We're gonna invest in the salvation of other people. I'm telling you, in the next decade, there is a harvest that God is wanting to see happen in the greater Bay Area. And he's waiting for people to go all in, to get over the things that you're in the middle of that is taking all your time and energy and to put your best energy into saving other people. Come on, we're here to invite more people to be filled up with new life in Jesus Christ. I'm grateful there's a church in San Francisco called Canvas. I'm grateful for Anthem Church in Oakland. But I'm telling you, in the decade ahead, our church should have some investment in a whole bunch of other church plants around the area so that more people can find Jesus. That's why we're here. Amen. That's who we are. I know different times that it's hard to stretch and wonder how it's all gonna work out. But I've also learned this, I've never regretted the moments that God's calling me to stretch towards something and say, God, um, I don't know how to do that, but if we can save more people, if we can help more people, if we can give to Convoy of Hope, if we can send some of our dollars around the world, we're gonna do that. Because that's not just what we do, that's who we are. We are blessed to be a blessing. We are called to go into all the world. We are the people who don't fight the wrong battles. We're people who fight to see people saved. Between now and September 29th, it's about 14 days between now and then, I wanna call you to some prayer and fasting. Fasting just means you're gonna give something up. So normally we think about it in terms of a meal, so many of you could give up a meal a day for 14 days. Some of you, it's an item, you know, that you love a lot. Uh, it could be something completely different. It could just be a time-consuming item. So some of you, I, I know you can't shut down all your technology, but some of you could just stop surfing the internet. Some of you could stop being on social media. Like, you might even need to post. For the next 14 days, I'm gonna be off social media for sacred purposes. And then the time that you would have spent on that, start praying for a miracle night. Start praying for the people in our church that need a miracle. You might not need a miracle, but somebody might need your faith for their miracle. Somebody might need your prayer for their miracle. And they're gonna come September 29th, and I believe collectively, the more that uh, New Life people are leaning into this, the more God's gonna do. Something happens when we pray that doesn't happen when we don't. And maybe giving something up. Teenagers, you can't give up homework, okay? That doesn't count, all right? <laughs> do your homework. Um, but it might be that you're not gonna go to the mall as much. You're not gonna go to the golf course this, you know, for the next 14 days. You're not gonna go, you're not gonna go do something. You're gonna fast something for eternal purposes. You're gonna give up something temporal for something eternal. Let's do this together. Let's lean in. Because I believe God is waiting to speak to the people of God who want to, in all their ways, acknowledge him 
and he will direct your path. If you're ready to receive more of God's direction, if you're ready to kind of lean into this, would you just say it with your hands today? God, we're ready. We need more of this. So Jesus, help us. And I pray, Lord, even right now, I pray for people in this auditorium right now who need direction for this week. Lord, there's things that are gonna happen this week that we need your guide. Parents that need direction. People in their careers that need direction. People in school that need direction. Lord, this week, as we trust you with all of our ways, we're gonna believe that you're gonna guide our paths. We're gonna listen. We're gonna be ready. We wanna be more tuned in. God, tune our ear even in the next few moments of worship. And I pray that you'd build up the people of God for the week that's ahead. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.